We're going to take a break from Hebrews after today uh, for the summer, for the months of June and July. We've got a, just a kind of a fun series. I'm not going to tell you what it's called because you might not come. Um, <laughs> But it's going to be fun and funny. We've got some humor that's going to happen in the morning. We've got a surprise for you. Be here. You're not going to want to miss it. Um, but the reason we're taking a break is because my favorite chapters of Hebrews are coming up, and you guys don't come to church in the summer. So I want to make sure we get those in when you guys start coming back to church um, coming in the spring. So kids camp's going on. It's like happening right now, like the masses are making their way up to Christopher Creek. If you would, uh, would you just pray over this week? Like as you think about it, anytime it comes to your mind, every time you see a pine tree, just pray for these kiddos and these, these counselors. Um, I think I've been up there for 50 different retreats over my lifetime to this same location, whether, whether they were men's retreats or work crew, high school camps or whatever, whatever it was. And God does a mighty work on this property. I don't, know, I don't know how he does things, but for whatever reason, this campus, this property up in Christopher Creek uh, does mighty, mighty work in people's hearts. So pray over that. Also pray because it's like kind of crazy up there too, like mayhem kind of happens. I can remember in high school, um, I was on work crew and our job was to clean the bathrooms each day and there was the mud war day where everyone played with mud and then went into the bathrooms to take showers afterwards. And so that night... The work crew had to stay up late to clean the bathroom, and we thought it was a good idea to bring the hose into the bathroom. And we just thought, we'll just hose the place down. And what we realized very quickly is if you apply uh, a hose with dish soap, it becomes a fantastic uh, slip and slide. And what we also realized is the less amount of clothing you had on you allows you to slide even more quickly across the floor, so much so that one of our individuals got a good enough start and slid and put a hole through the wall. So <laughs> things like that happen, and so it needs your prayer as well. Um, I think that's it. Um, let's pray for the morning and let us get into God's word. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the testimony of truth that is within it. Um, we trust it, Lord. We lean into it. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've got your Bibles, um, Stuart Black, how many of you were here last week for Stuart Black? He did a fantastic job telling us about this mysterious man of Melchizedek and, and uh, how he was an important piece in ushering in a priesthood, a lineage of priesthood of Jesus Christ, that we needed a new order because, we'll, as we'll see in a second, uh, the old order wasn't, wasn't accomplishing what it needed to, and so you had this mysterious character, Melchizedek, that ushered in that new order, and so it was, if you get a chance to see Stuart, give him a big thanks and a hug and tell him he's the man. Um, today, we're going to stay in, in chapter 7. I'm going to allude to a couple of things that were in the section that uh, Stuart had, but primarily we're going to be in Hebrews 7, 22 through 28. So if you've got your Bible, um, let's spend some time there. And... Uh, this is one of those sections of scripture where um, my prayer all week and, and coming into this passage, my prayer was that I wouldn't get in the way. Uh, some of the verses that we will come across are some of the most beautiful verses in all of scripture. So much of what Open Door has been founded on, when you, when you hear us talk of grace and you hear us talk of these words like new covenant, um, like we would call ourselves a new covenant-based church. Um, some, of, some of that kind of how we see and how we see God's word and how we see Jesus and how we see ourselves um, flows through uh, many of the words on these pages. So uh, my prayer is that I wouldn't get in the way. And so here's my hope, honestly, today, is that you would meditate on the verses far more than listen to me. And so um, as they pop up on the screen, if I'm still talking, ignore me and read the verses. Um, <laughs> As you're, as you're in, your, in your Bible, you've got it open on your lap. Um, read the verses even as I'm talking. You're not going to offend me. Uh, these verses are far more sacred than anything that will come out of my mouth. So um, please, I, I, I really do want us to be intentional this morning. I know oftentimes we put big chunks of Scripture up, up, up on the screen, and it can almost become white noise. Don't let it be white noise today. Um, let it sink in. Let it remind you of what is true uh, let it resonate in your heart, and um, 
and be a gift to your soul, a salve to the soul. I like saying that. I'm going to pick up uh, the first, well, let me, let me preface something really quick. Um, I think there's three great questions of life that, that at some point every person, whether they know it or not, will have to answer the question. Um, the first question is uh, something to do with the reality of what will make me complete? What will make me whole? Um, I, I, think, I think there's not a person walking this earth that doesn't walk around knowing that at some degree they carry a bit of a deficit. And, uh, and if they don't, they are a delusional something. Um, I, th I think a question that has to be answered for humanity is, what, what will make me complete? What will make me whole? And I think we get to answer that today. I think another question that has to be answered um, is what will draw me near to God? What is the very thing that will cause nearness to God? There, there is a God. Everyone will have to come to that conclusion at some point. Um, but there is a God. And, and what, what does it look like to be brought near to him? What does it look like to be separated from him? But what does it look like to be brought near to him? Uh, truly, if that, if that question does not get answered, we spend eternity separated from him. If we don't figure out what the solution to that is, we will spend eternity separated from him. And, th and then I think a, a, a final question that has to be answered is, um, what is, what does my life amount to after I'm gone? Where do I go? What happens? I, I think there are many that think it just ends, but I think a lot of people believe it goes on, and something happens in the future, and, and we have to have an answer to it. We have to be able to reconcile where it is that we will spend eternity. And I think, um, I think these verses do a fantastic job of giving answer to that, those three things. So um, this would be a section of scripture that I would, if I were you, I'd spend a lot of time in. Uh, we're going to be in seven, but also eight, nine, and ten. I think are some of the goldest, most beautiful sections in all of Scripture. This would be a great place to hang out uh, as you return back to Hebrews after our study. Let's, let's pick up in uh, 7.11. This was part of where Stuart went, um, but I want to I use it to, to lead us into our section as well. It says this, Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law... What further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, you might, you might underline this verse. This is, a, this is a pretty powerful verse. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. A uh, foundational thing we've got to understand is he's going to describe this thing called a better covenant. We use the language new covenant because it's the newer one. Uh, our author uses the language better, a better covenant. And what you have to understand is that he, remember, he's writing to an audience who is his abandoning the better covenant to resort back to the old covenant the worst covenant. And so what we're, what we're getting into here, he's saying, listen, you got to understand before we get any further, if the system that was in place through the Levitical priesthood, through the line of Aaron, was actually doing a good job, there wouldn't be a need for a new priest to show up. There wouldn't be a need for a new system. And then he, and then he adds this really interesting phrase. He says... For when there is a change in that priesthood, there also needs to be a change in the law. What does that mean? Here's, here's, here's part of what it means. We'll get further into it as we go. Do you understand the law, which we would call the Ten Commandments, or the, even the ceremonial law that got put in place when the priests started showing up, um, the whole system of atonement and forgiveness and forgiveness of sins, and, and coming near to the Father, coming near to God, 
All of that uh, priestly system of atonement, the, shac- the sacrifices, the sh- all of that was a response to the fact that we couldn't keep the law, that we couldn't keep the system that was meant to bring us near to God. And so therefore, we appointed priests to help advocate for us before God, right? So if you're going to change the whole order of the priestlyhood, that means that the law, the system in which we were brought near to God, that's going to change as well, isn't it? It's a pretty cool thought when you think about it. They kind of go hand in hand. You can't, you can't have one without the other. And we're not talking about law like we talk about law here where you can't speed and different things. We're talking about the law that draws near to the Father, that draws near to the Lord, the system that has been put in place over humanity that guarantees if it is followed that you will be near God. Does that make sense? Pretty cool. And then he goes on. And verses like this I'm really thankful for because it's the things I want to say, but Scripture gets to say it for me instead, and I don't have to be the bad guy. It says this, For on one hand, a former commandment, it's set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. You might circle weakness and uselessness. For the law, the old system that brought you near to God, made nothing perfect. Do you hear what it's saying? I didn't say this. I didn't write this. The Ten Commandments, the old system, it says was in fact needed to be set aside because it was weak and useless and never had the ability to make anything. It doesn't even say anyone. It says nothing perfect. It's amazing. It's amazing. Do you think he's trying to get the attention of his audience? Those, remember them, they, they, they have begun to, to believe in Jesus and now they're resorting back for numerous different reasons, some persecution, some other things, but they're resorting back to the old system. And he's going, can I tell you something? Bag it. Put it in the trash and throw it away. It was useless, it was weak, and it had no ability to perfect anything. That's a, that's a bold claim. And you go, well, well, hold on, Caleb. You're talking about something God created, and you're, you're, you're saying it's, like, bad. Is that what we're saying? No. We're saying the system that promised to be able to bring us near to God was actually not designed to do so. Listen to this. Romans 5 says... The law came in, this is a verse you want to memorize. The law came in so that sin would increase. Can you believe that's in the Bible? The Ten Commandments showed up so that sin would actually increase. You go, well, that that seems weird. Do you know why? So that every single one of us would go, I need a Savior. So that every single one of us, you know what it says after it? It says, so that sin would increase, and where sin increased, grace would abound all the more. So that you and I would know our need for a Savior, and we would fall on our hands and knees and say, I can't do it on my own. I need something to intercede on my behalf. Do you know that was the design of the law? And so he says, lay it aside. The system that says if you follow these things, you'll be right with God, do you know that there is no power in that? It's actually incredibly weak and useless. Um, This word perfect, um, he uses it three or four more times in the section that we're going to have. This word is not um, perfect in the sense of like without error. When we think of the word perfect, we think think of this word like I don't make any mistakes. He's going to describe you as perfect at some point in chapter 10, and you're going to go, have you hung out with me? I'm not perfect. This word that he's describing here is this word of like a fulfillment or a completion or a maturing or a ripening. I like the idea of a ripening, right? Coming into the full maturity of what you are designed to be. The law had an inability to do that within you. Is that cool? Does that make sense where we're tracking? 
And then he goes on, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced. Who's the better hope? Jesus. On the other hand, so you had this old system, this old way that was useless, it was weak, it had no ability to ripen you into, into the design of who you were supposed to be, had no ability to perfect in you the things of God. But on the other hand, this new thing came in, and it was a better hope. And it has the ability, what does it say, in which we are able now to draw near to God. You have to understand, you guys, this is really good news. Humanity, for thousands of years, was given one system. Obey the list, and if you do, you become near to God. And oh, by the way, none of you can do it. And all of a sudden it says, but then came a better hope. And through that better hope, through that new way, through that new system, he's going to call it a better covenant, we have now the ability to draw near. And you say, Caleb, how does this relate to, to me? Like this is, we're talking about Jewish people who, who practiced this old way. Um, do you know that the church, in large, across America, across the globe, does a fantastic job of telling you to worry a bunch about your sin, of teaching you how to know which sins are on the list, of teaching you how to know which sins are kind of maybe not on the list if you do it with a happy heart, (laughs) teaches you a lot on how to combat sin, how to take sin out in the street and give it a good fight. Do you know that that's the old system? That's the old system. And by the way, It's useless, it's weak, and it doesn't do what you think it's going to do. That's the old system. Hear me clearly. What God set up in the Ten Commandments are not bad things. They are right at the heart of God. They're His. They're good. They're holy. They're beautiful, beautiful, beautiful designs of how humanity should get to live. But it is no longer the means by which we get close to God. It is no longer the means by which we draw near to Him. It is no longer the means by which we find our completeness. It is no longer the means by which we find our perfection. You living up to those Ten Commandments or a whole other list of them or a whole other list of what some Christians tell you you should live up to does not perfect you. It does not draw you nearer to God. Now, if it shows you your need for God, that's good news. Okay, we we tracking? You tracking with me? I got a little stern there. I I had a finger out. When the pastor pulls a finger out, that's that's trouble. Settle down, big guy. Just because you got a microphone. And then we pick up in our section. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. This makes Jesus, do you know that, what that word is? I didn't even pronounce it correctly because I have a hard time reading. But um, guarantor, do you know what that word is? It's a financial term. Have you ever had someone co-sign with you? Someone, so, so I can remember I, I, bought a, um, I bought a vehicle early on in my marriage with Kaylee and we, we didn't have good enough credit and we had no money. And still, a car company wanted to sell us a car, which is really interesting to me. But um, they said, hey, you're going to need a co-signer on this because we don't trust that you're going to actually be able to pay the bills. And so we called up my mom and we said, Mom, would you, would you co-sign on this vehicle for us? And she said, absolutely. And it makes me question uh, some things about where, no, um, it, was, it was this beautiful, beautiful, incredible gift um, that someone would say, if you choose not to pay the debt, um, I've got it covered. It's amazing. Do you know, like, that's crazy amazing that someone would consider doing that. Yes, I I bought a car and I put it on a a financial plan. Don't tell Dave Ramsey. But for someone to put their neck out on my behalf is an incredible reality. Do you know that um, what it's saying about Jesus is that he is that for this new covenant, for this better way, 
What's being said here is that the reason why Jesus secures and locks in the deal is because he is the one willing to put down the full price if you and I screw it up. And guess what? We have. And guess what? He continues to say, I got it. It's actually already been paid for, the whole thing. I'm glad you think that you're still a part of the deal, but it's actually already been all taken care of. Isn't that amazing that it calls him that? That picture of a co-signer, and he really is not even a co-signer, he's just the only signer. Pretty cool, pretty cool. And then he goes on, and, and he just starts talking about why he is qualified in a sense. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. See that word permanently? It's the only time it's used in the New Testament. You might, you might underline it. You might circle it. You might, you might wonder about it. Um, if, you ever, if you ever wondered, like, okay, he had this first covenant, and now he's got this second covenant, is he going to come up with a third? Like, is he going to go back on his word? Is he going to change his mind about how he does things? Um, I want you to know that this new covenant, this new system, this new way, it's permanent. It's not going anywhere. He's good on his word. Do you hear that? It's permanent. Why is it permanent? Because he continues forever, is what it says. Why were the old priests ineffective? Because they kept dying. They couldn't seem to stay alive. Do you know why Jesus is so effective? Because he's alive. And he's going to stay alive. And that's why his seat is permanent on the throne. His seat is permanent as your high priest. His seat is not changing because he's not dying. He's not going anywhere. He's living on forever. And that was the promise that was made. Is that good? Is that good news? So like, like you, say, you say these questions sometimes, yeah, but what if I? Right? Like, like I, I get it. He's in control of this new contract, this new deal between me and God, me drawing near to God. You want to know how you get near to God? Jesus. It says that he is the way, that he is the truth, that he is the life, and that no one gets to the Father except through him. There's one way now. There wasn't 10 rules. There's one way. And you say, yeah, but what if, I, um, what if I sin so much? Like, what if I just keep on sinning? And what if I, what if I sin and, and it's like an unrepentant sin? Like, what if I never say sorry about that sin? What if? Well, let's see what he says. Keep going. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost. I wonder what that word uttermost means. He is able to save completely those who draw near to him, to God, through him. Why? Since he always lives to make intercession for them. My little children, this is what 1 John says, the, the author John, my little children, I write these things to you so that you don't sin. I want you to be encouraged. Not, you don't have to live that way. But if any of you do happen to sin, I want you to know that um, we have an advocate with the Father. And his name is Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, the payment for your sins. And not for yours only, but for the rest of the world. Do you know that if you choose to access God through Jesus Christ, he saves you completely? Do you know that when he hung on the cross, he wasn't just paying for your sins that you said sorry about? Do you know that he was paying for all of them? All of them. You know how I know? Let's see what he says. Hmm, I thought that verse was going to say something different, but that's okay. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. Do you, do you know what these first words say? For it was indeed fitting. You know what this means? 
that he, it actually says it in a different language. I don't, actually don't love this translation. I wonder what some of your other translations say, but it really means that he met our needs. It was important that we had him meeting our needs. What were the things that we needed to be close to God? Well, we needed to be holy. We needed to be innocent. We needed to be unstained. We needed to be separated from sin, and we needed to be seated in heaven. And guess what? Through Christ Jesus and him alone, he met that need for us. Is that amazing? Today's Pentecost Sunday. Do you guys know that? Today's Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost is the day that the Holy Spirit dwelt man. It's a magical day. 50 days after Jesus. That's what the word Pentecost means. It's 50 days. 50 days after Jesus rose from the grave, he went and hung out with his disciples in a room that was locked, and he showed up, and they're like, where did this guy come from? And then Thomas was like, it's not him. And he goes, feel my side, feel my hands. And then he's like, it's him. And then he said to them, he said, don't do anything until the helper comes. So the spirit of the living God comes and rests upon you. 50 days later, there's 120 of them sitting in a room and the wind rushes in and fire starts showing up and they're like, yoo-hoo! And they get filled with the spirit of the living God and they go outside and they start preaching in all these different languages and tongues and everyone can understand them and they're like, are these guys drunk or what are they on? Can I get some? And they start, and Peter gets up on these steps and he declares out to thousands of people, he goes, they're not drunk, it's only the morning. And by the way, I want you to know what has happened. Jesus Christ, who we all crucified, he rose from the grave. And not only that, he now has filled us with the living God. And he has exchanged our life for his. And people go, I want some of that. And thousands of people come to know Jesus that day. And they get baptized in the water. And it is the church is born. Do you want to know what's crazy? He's not going to say it here. But that's the reality of what took place is that not only was Jesus the perfect sacrifice, the perfect qualified high priest on your behalf, to, to be that advocate before the Father on your behalf, he also gives you all of these things. Do you know that? That's what's crazy about this good news of the gospel, is not that he just stood in the gap for us, but he said, I want you to have my life because I'm going to take yours and I'm going to nail it to a cross. Do you know that because of the work of Christ, because of the way that he has made you clean, that you are holy and innocent and unstained and separated from sin. You know, he says your sin is as far as the east is to the west. It's amazing. And this is not just God looking at you and seeing Jesus. Jesus gets in the way. This is actually both imputed and imparted righteousness. You have become this and Christ has stood in the gap for you both. He's been the guarantor of that debt, but he's also made you brand new, and we celebrate that on this day. Let's keep going. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once and for all. How many times did he do it? And for how much? All. One time. The sacrifice that he did, it was one time. Do you know that I talk with a lot of Christians that don't believe that? They believe it on paper, but they live a different reality. They feel like every day they've got to go before the Father and ask for forgiveness again. He says, it's done, my child. It's already been paid for. There is no need for any confessional booth anymore. It's done. But can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? There is a beautiful thing that happens. It's already been forgiven. It's already been taken care of. But there's a beautiful thing that happens when you know you've sinned against the Father for you to get to go to him and say, hey, I'm, I'm so sorry. It's a beautiful relational piece. You don't have to. Like, those sins are still forgiven. They've already been taken care of once, and all of them have been taken care of. But there's a beautiful relational piece when you go, man, I just broke the heart of my God. And for you to enter into a space with him and just go, hey, I, I, I'm so sorry. I don't want to live that way. That's so sacred and beautiful. You don't have to do it. It's already been dealt with, but it is a beautiful thing if you get to do it. Um, don't miss this sentence. It's talking about him as a high priest, right? What was the role of the high priest? To be that advocate between man's sin and God, right? That thing, that bridge that would bring them together. It's talking about him as the high priest, but look what it says. 
It says he doesn't have to do sacrifices daily for his own sins and then for those of the people because what happened? Since he did this once and for all, what did he do? He offered up himself. So here's this high priest walking to the altar to sacrifice on behalf of the sins of humanity and he's getting ready to take the bull and the lamb and what does he take? He takes himself. Is that amazing that our high priest, the one who stands as the advocate, says, you want to know why I know it worked? Because it was me. I sacrificed myself on the altar. You know what qualifies me to be the right high priest? Is that I'm clean and that I'm whole and that I'm perfect and that I can stand before the Father without any sin on my, on my, on my account. And you want to know what also is true? Because that's the reality, I'm also qualified to be the perfect sacrifice. I'm both. That's why he's the great guarantor of the deal, because he's both parts. He's the sacrifice. He's the thing that made you clean. He's the only sacrifice that was perfect and good enough to last forever. And he is that same high priest that lives forever because of the sacrifice of himself. Like that should just put you on the ground, floor you, when you realize that the beauty of this new covenant is that he did it for you. And you can say, yeah, but what if I, but what if I, but what if I? Take I out of the sentence. It's him, it's Jesus alone. He's the one who saves you. He's the one who makes you right. He's the one who makes you whole. He's the one who draws you near to the Father. He's the one who gets you home. Is that good news? Yeah. Let's see if he says anything else. I think he's got one more verse. For the law appoints men in their weakness as a high priest, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Um, I just, again, I just want these verses to, to do the teaching. I want these verses to resonate in your heart. If you, if you don't know this Jesus, if you've never chosen to trust him with your life, um, I want to ask you to do that today. I want to ask you to trust him. He's the only way to God. He's the only one to make you whole. He's the only one to get you home. Period. End of story. And uh, I thank you for letting me share that with you. I, I want us to just go straight to the table. Um, I want us to remember that night where Jesus is sitting with his 12 buddies, right? The night before he goes to go to be uh, uh, crucified. And he sits at this table, and they're all sitting over dinner, and he, he's, he has this cup of, of juice or wine, and he's got this bread. And he starts talking to his buddies and he says, hey, I want to tell you something. Um, I know for thousands of years we've been under this old covenant, this old system. And he, all he does is he just hands out this cup and he says, um, this represents my life, my blood, and this, this bread's going to re represent my body broken. And um, will, you, will you take of this new covenant, this new way, this new system that is founded on me, on me being the guarantee, on me being the advocate on your behalf, on me being the perfect sacrifice. And all he asks, do you know what he asks of you and I? Not to follow some list of rules anymore. The only thing he asks is that you would take the cup from him and say yes. That's it. That's the good news of the gospel, is that all you have to do is believe in him. And so, they don't even know what they're doing in the moment. They'll know later, but they take this cup. And so when we gather, when we take communion, that's what we're doing. We're just remembering this moment when Jesus Christ ushered in the new way. And then he hung, right, on the cross. And he bled out and his body broke. They stabbed him in the side. And he declared these words, it's done. The new covenant is done. The better covenant is sealed. The guarantee has been put in place. And if you want proof, he raised from the grave three days later. He said, see, told you it worked. So we celebrate that. Let me, let me pray over that. Let's take communion together. Jesus Christ, you are the way. You are the truth. You are the life. No one gets to the Father except through you. And we believe the cross was enough. We believe the cross worked. We believe that you are our advocate, that you are our high priest, that you are the Holy One of God, that you are the Savior of the world. We believe it. We declare it. We rest in it. We stand firm in it. And we drink this communion. We take this communion in remembrance of it, in celebration, in anticipation of what this new life in Christ would look like for all of us. We give you our lives, we give you this time, we give you our worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, during this time, you're free to get up, move about.
Um, we'll have communion set up. We've got some worship. Um, but also, this is a time of prayer, too. If you're needing prayer, um, we're going to have prayer team. I believe they'll be in the back. I don't know where they are right now. They'll probably be in the back. Um, but if you need prayer, there's Margarita. She'll pray for you. You want Margarita praying for you, let me tell you that. Um, but just if you need prayer right now, if you want to just meet with someone and pray over them that you know is going through a, a season, um, you're free to do that. Stay in worship. Take communion together. Love you guys. Hope you have a great, great rest of your Sunday.